if you will, this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about the simplicity that is in Christ. And we've, uh, I've been, it's the summertime, and I know folks come and go, and uh, then vacation and kind of thin down. And uh, uh, we're going to look this morning at, we've been looking at some things that we've studied in the past. I look back through my records, and uh, when we studied the, our ambassadorship, see, that took, you know, half a year to go through. <laughs> it took 14 weeks to go through it, you know. So we, uh, and then we did some other things, and some of this we haven't talked about in a while, so I thought it would be just kind of refreshing in our, in our thinking, just remind a, 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 of, of some things, and then for the new folks and for folks who are just coming in, then maybe here's something uh, new for you. Uh, we've been talking about, uh, we, uh, so forth here, uh, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3 and 4 is kind of going to be our launch verse uh, for this morning. And then we'll see how far we get here and maybe even next week, okay? And again, we've, we talked last week about that issue of glorious freedom and, and that liberty that we have in Christ and, and using that liberty to, by love, serve one another. And then we talked, so again, some identity uh, issues. And, and when you read verse number three, here Paul is going to kind of bring that home with the Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians were an interesting group of people and a, and a very interesting local assembly. Uh, Corinth, if you know anything of, of Greece and of the middle, the Mediterranean area, Corinth and, and, and that part of the, of the world was, was a very wealthy uh, part of the world in, in, in the first century. And they had great wealth. And the church at Corinth was this church where that just kind of didn't quite catch on fast, and it took them some time. And in, Paul has written to them at least four times that we can tell in, in the references in the two books that we, the two letters that we have that are scripture. And as he's been dealing with the Corinthians, and he's what? You check your mic. Check my mic. I'm on. We're on. Okay. All right, must be. Okay. Sounds good to you? Sound good to me, too. I was, why? Yeah, he, yeah he, he's a little worried about that back corner over there. Maybe we ought to remove that pew, <laughs> you know. Well, <laughs> I just thought about two jokes, you know. And I'd, get in, I'd get in so much trouble, you know. Anyway, so as he's been dealing, as Paul, let's get back, do, do something spiritual here, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, you, you heard about the two skunks that went to church? They sat in their own pew. Uh, okay, that's what went through my head. Okay, there you go. Let them, you know. All right. Well, you, you heard about the blonde that got pulled over. The officer pulled her over, and the policeman comes up to the door and asks her for her driver's license, and she's digging through her purse looking can't find it, and the lady, and the female officer's like, it's got your picture on it, you know, so she finds a little, and, and, and the lady's, it's just a little card, it's got your picture on it, the officer says, so she finds a mirror, looks in, and, and then turns around, and is this it, and the, and the female officer says, well, I'm sorry, I'll let you go, I didn't realize you were a policeman too. Guess what? The policeman, she was a blonde too, okay? <laughs> All right. See, I told you, I, they get bad. I, I can go worse. No, that's, that, was, that was a good one? Okay. All right. So can we get back to the spiritual things now? Okay. <laughs> I sound better now? Okay. There you go. <laughs> it must be the cold air. I don't know. I tell you what. How do you follow that up? All right. <laughs> As Paul has... Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. First, Second Corinthians eleven. Yeah, yeah. Second Corinthians eleven and verse three. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, folks. The wonderful thing about the message of grace and having the grace life is that you can have some fun. You don't have to be a stick in the mud all the time. Okay, just some of the time. Okay, 
Oh, I get in trouble all the time. Anyway. All right, 2 Corinthians 11. Let's read verse number 3 and get our minds back in out of the gutter and into the book here. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh, and Paul's been dealing with the Corinthians about this guy named he. It's an interesting thing. Paul doesn't name this individual. He talks about he back in chapter 10. He'll talk about verse 7. Uh, uh, do ye look on things after the outward appearance, if any man trust to himself. You see the man there? There's, a, there's an individual that's going around right behind Paul and causing Paul in the ministry trouble, and he's stirring the pot, and he's doing this comparison thing. That, and he gets a group, if, you're, if you look up at chapter 10, verse 10, for his letters say, they. See, he went in, and, he, and he, he, he got them all stirred up, and now he's got a little following, and now it's a they. And this guy runs, you, you, you begin to look at him, and he actually is the, the troublemaker in the book of Galatians. It's the same guy. Paul never names him. Some, some say that he's the thorn in the flesh that Paul will, will uh, label here in chapter 12. Uh, Paul doesn't say that. Some say the, tw- the thorn in the flesh is the physical ailments. Paul doesn't say it. You know why he doesn't say it, don't you? Because you'll, you'll have the same thorn in the flesh. And you'll make the thorn in the flesh the issue then rather than the answer to the prayer. <laughs> and he said unto me, the answer to the prayer. See? So when Paul is dealing with the Corinthians here, and he's dealing with this guy that just, kind of just coming in and causing trouble. So he brings up a very interesting point here about our identity and where our mindset should be. And he brings in Eve in verse 3, but 11.3, But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve. And he begins to bring in this issue of the simplicity that is in Christ. You think about the simplicity, simple. Come back to Psalms 19. Psalms 19. Okay? Psalms 19. That issue of simple. Everything we have in Christ, folks, is simple. It's not complex. It doesn't require you to have a PhD, a THD, a DD, a BA, an MA. It doesn't require you to have all of that. It just requires you to have a singleness of mindset. That's what the word simple is. Singleness, not complex. Simple, being unmixed, free from being corrupted. Psalms 19, if you look at verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Isn't that interesting? The law of the Lord, the Word of God, the Word of the Lord. What did the Lord give Israel? The law, the word. What is it? It's simple. In the law's case, come over to chapter 119, 119 of the book of Psalms. Psalms 119 and and verse 130. You see, folks, it's a very fascinating thing when you think about the word of God. It's going to make the the wise simple. Psalms 119 and verse number 130. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Isn't that interesting how it says that? You see, we have the simplicity in Christ where? In the word, don't we? When we look at the simplicity, we have to look at the word of God because that's where it is contained. Come over to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs 14. As as I get older and a little more study under the belt, I'm impressed at how Paul pulls out of the Old Testament principles. This is a principle. 
Now, I realize the Spirit, the Holy Spirit wrote the word through Paul. I got that, and the Holy Spirit will know all of this. But the simplicity that is in Christ, and the fact that he goes back to use the issue with Eve, Proverbs 14 and verse number 15, the simple believeth every word. Proverbs 14, verse 15. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. What, the simp, what are they going to do? They're going to believe. And, and that really becomes the issue. It's believing what the Word of God says to you, about you, and about what, what is going on today, and what He's doing. So when you come back to 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Notice that Paul goes and uses an event with Eve. The simplicity, the, the, the fact, uh, let me get back over there, that the serpent beguiled Eve and came in and he did some things with Eve. 1 Timothy 2 says that she was deceived. And she was deceived by, look, look over there, 1 Timothy 2. I'm, Verse 13 and 14, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. Boy, boy, what a testimony. Adam willfully did what Adam did. But the woman, being deceived, was in the transgression. She was deceived. How was she deceived? How did he, come, come back to Genesis 3. That's really where I'm at, headed here. Genesis 3. How did Eve, how did the serpent beguile Eve? What did he do to her? Well, Genesis 3, you know the story very well. I look around the room and ought to be preaching to the choir today, but I'm preaching to you instead, <laughs> okay? Look at Genesis 3, look at verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. What did he, say? What did he do to her? Yea, hath God said. Now, we realize in, in, the, next, in the rest of these verses that the serpent is going to, he's going to come along and cause her to be, to kind of rethink some things, but he does it by doing what? First thing out of his mouth is, yea, hath God, excuse me, yea, hath God said. Romans chapter 4, the apostle Paul talking about Abraham says, what saith the Scripture? That's the, there's the question. That's why on the, above the double doors coming into the room, guess what it says? What saith the Scripture? What does Satan do here? He comes up to Eve. He's going to beguile her. He's going to trick her. He's going to cause her to begin to rethink some things. And he's going to say, did God really say that? Did he say, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Is that what he really said to her? No. She took out the word freely, grace, added the word touch it, and put in the law, put in a performance thing. Isn't that interesting? People say, some, and I've said it too, that Eve was lacking some, some uh, direction from Eve, or, I'm sorry, from Adam, and, and that's not always the case. She understood. She took out that word, freely eat, and added something into it. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave it unto her husband with her. And he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. Yea, hath God said. Look, he goes in and he causes Eve to begin to rethink about what God has already taught her. Come back to chapter 1. What was Eve? Chapter 1. 
Chapter 1 and verse number 26. Where was Eve? Who was Eve? What, what was going on here? Look at who Eve is. Verse 26, chapter 1. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created Man in his own image, in the image of God, created he him. Male and female, created he them. Was there anything wrong with Adam and Eve in that moment right here? They were what? Perfect, weren't they? She had the very image of God, of the Godhead. Paul tells you and I that we're to grow up into Christ, that we're to be conformed to the image of his Son. See, what's the goal for you and I to be? to be verse 26 and 27. See? Eve had it. She was already there. And you know what Satan does? By asking one simple little question. Yea, hath God said. She was willing to leave that identity she had in Christ to go be something that was lesser than that. So Satan, right here, begins the attack. He reveals his plan of attack. And his plan is to come in and attack the Word of God. The simplicity that is in Christ. The identity that you and have, I have in Christ first it comes that we are going to do what? Believe the Word of God. Come back to 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 11. Might as well stick something in here. When you talk about the simplicity in Christ, or if you, even if you talk about the grace life and, and living life and living it in, in the issues of grace and understanding, you're, we're not talking about just throwing out things over here and not doing this and doing that. We're talking about taking who you are in Christ and going and living that way. The simplicity, and by the way, it is simple. We looked last week at Romans 6, that issue of being free, free from the dominion of sin. Folks, those verses are simple. They are clear. They are concise. Romans 6. You know what the hard part is in all that? Believe in them. You know that? That is the hard part. To, for that verse to say that your old man is crucified and that you are freed from sin, wow, the struggle is simply believing it. That's the hardest part. But you know what? That's the simplicity that's in Christ. That's the stand fast in the liberty. Verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility. What was his subtility? Yea, hath God said. Does that book really say what you would saying it is? You guys over there that believe in grace and right division and dispensationalism, you guys are just simply easy believism. You think that anybody can then go out and live any way they want to live? I, it's been thrown. You know that. You understand it. It's been said to you. And the answer to that is Romans 6. God forbid. How dare you go live any way you want to go live? You've got a new identity to go live in. And it's a simple identity. It's not a complex thing. You know who makes it complex? We do. <laughs> I do. My flesh does. Now watch verse number 4. And again, he, the adversary's going to use the same thing that he used on Eve. He's going to use it on you and I. Okay? Yea, hath God said. Because look at the next verse. Verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth a what? Another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit whom ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Look at that. A guy shows up, a preacher, a teacher, someone who is going to use Scripture. If he's going to preach another Jesus, 
He's got to use Scripture to preach another Jesus. If he's going to preach another spirit or another gospel, he's using the Scripture, isn't he? He has to be. Otherwise, you would dismiss him, wouldn't you? You would say, no, thank you. Now come over to Galatians 1. Galatians chapter 1. Another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. Galatians 1 verse 6. By the way, this doesn't take a lifetime to do it. Watch this verse in verse 6. Notice every word. I marvel that ye are so, what? Soon. This is a quick thing. This isn't a lifetime of maybe drifting over. Nope, this is a drift. (laughs) You're there. You've swerved. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. What's going on there? They're preaching something else, aren't they? They're preaching another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit, and they're using the scripture to do it. How do you know that? Well, where's this thing about the angel? See that angel there? But though we are an angel from heaven... Have you ever wondered why he would say an angel from heaven? I did. So you go looking, don't you? Well, I found him, I think. I believe I have. And it's in the book of the Revelation. Come over to Revelation 14. Who is Paul the apostle to? The Gentiles, right? Look at Revelation 14. So if anyone comes up to you Gentiles and is preaching another Jesus, another gospel, another spirit, Let him be accursed. Now, in the book of Galatians, Galatians 5, accursed is simply cut off, okay? But look at Revelation 14, and look at verse 6 and 7. Because in Scripture, for me, this is the only angel from heaven preaching to Gentiles I was able to find. Look at 14.6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. Now stop there. Who's this angel from heaven preaching to? Everybody. The Gentiles. The nations. He would not be preaching to the little flock, the nation of Israel. There, Numbers 23 says they're not numbered among the nations. So who's he preaching to? Who is he? An angel. And where is he at? In the heavens. Now watch what he says in verse 7. Here is the everlasting gospel, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for He died for your sins and was raised again the third day. No, he doesn't say that, does he? What does he say? Fear God, give give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the water. You know what he does? He's back in Romans 1, verse 25, where, the, where, where they take the truth of God and turn it into a lie, and they worship the creature more than the Creator. You know what this angel's saying? You better get in line with God Almighty, the Creator. And you better give Him the glory and the honor. Nothing about Paul's gospel, but notice where are we at. We're in the book of the Revelation, aren't we? We're in a book of prophecy about the end times. For whose program? Israel. So in Galatians 1, when he says, hey, though we or an angel from heaven preach to you, you know what this guy's done? He just took you, the member of the body of Christ, and drug you out into the future and said, that's you. Huh? So guess what there is not really? A rapture. That's a spiritual thing. doesn't exist. Just made up. And they begin to spin the tails. But you see how Paul says, these guys are using Scripture. They're just not dispensational. See that? Most of the time people come back to Galatians. Most of the time, chapter 3. Most of the time people try to drag you back into Acts 2 and Pentecost and speaking in tongues and running the aisles. And You can run the aisle if you want. We're going to wonder about you later, but... 
we'll let you. It's okay. And you get excited. You know, hey, it's not wrong to get excited. For I tell you what, we ought to be the most excited group of people there is with the amens and, and everything. And some, you know, sometimes I, I look around, you got your bottom lip stuck so low, you trip over it. And it's like, well, no, you ought to be excited about who you are in Christ. And the simplicity that is in Christ. Look at Galatians 3, look at verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. When Paul preached to the folks at Galatia, and he gave them the gospel, it was so real to them, it was like Christ was crucified right there in their midst. That's what it meant to them. It energized them. It excited them. But someone has bewitched them. Bewitching. Another, there's that other term, beguilement. Bewitched. They've been tricked into another way of thinking. Verse 2. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? How did you guys get saved? Was it walking an aisle and doing, or was it just simply by faith trusting in Calvary? How are you so foolish? Verse 3. Only a fool would think any different. But are, how, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Guys, I was there. Where is the law simple or is it complex? It is complex. The law. I said that, right? The law is complex. You know why it's complex? Because it says, if you do this, then I will bless you. You never know if you did it right. You never know that you did it right until what comes your way? The blessing. So until the thing in Malachi, bring, you rob God of offerings and tithes. By the way, the big box in the back needs to be filled up. We got a bill to pay, okay? <laughs> Actually, we got two bills, okay? All right? But in that passage, God says, oh, look over there. I, I get offline here a little bit, rabbit trail, but where are you going to go? <laughs> Nowhere, right? Malachi 3. Malachi 3, it's right before Matthew. Malachi 3. Malachi 3, God is dealing with Israel. He's teaching her. Malachi 3, verse 7, Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Notice that everybody goes to verse 8, 9, and following. They never read verse 7. Verse 7 sets up the conversation he's going to have with them now. What does he want Israel to do? Return to me, and I'll return to you. And they say, how are we going to return to you? Give us an illustration then. You know, they mock the Lord later and says, if you're really the king of the Jews, come on down off that cross. And then we'll believe you. They ain't going to believe you. If you are going to return to us, then how are you going to do that? He says, verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye, and that will be the whole nation, okay? All the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Wow. You, you want the blessing, then you've got to come over here and do what? Prove, prove me. Test me. Do what I've asked you to do. And then I'll do what? Everything I told you I'll do for you. See that? That's complex. Because you don't know if you did it right until what happens? 
He comes along. You know what the simplicity says? It is not complex. I have done it all for you. It's all yours. All you got to do is believe me. That's it. No more. Come over to back over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians. Well, you know what? Let's move on. Let's do that. Yeah, Ephesians 4. Well, that'll work. You see, folks, the simplicity that's there. Satan says, yea, hath God said. You better be saying, yeah, he has said, and this is what he said. This is who I am. He's going to use people to come along. Ephesians 4, verse 14, he says, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the, what, slight of men and cunning, craft, and cunning craftiness whereby they lie, L-I-E, lie. And wait to do, to do what? To deceive. What's the system out there designed to do? To deceive you, to bewitch you, to beguile you, to come along and to cause you to not be who you are in Christ. To come along and say, no, that's not really you. That's somebody else and you can get there one day, but you've got to do steps A, B, C, and D. Isn't that, a, isn't that the way it is? And you know what Paul says? No, that is not the simplicity that's in Christ. Come back to chapter 1 of Ephesians. Folks, we have an identity. Chapter 1. We have an identity that the moment that we said, I do to the Savior and trusted that He paid the penalty of my sin and my sins, took care of everything, Colossians chapter 2, he calls that, he calls that it the operation of God. Some things begin to happen to you, and you know who does it? He does it. And you know what? You don't feel it. I'm sorry. You don't get the tingle down the back of your spine and the hair. Now, you may have had that emotional experience the moment you got saved, and that's fine, but that wasn't God doing that to you. The only way you know that this happens to you is by opening the Word of God and studying it rightly divided. That's the only way. When Eve, she saw that the fruit was what? Good. She began to act upon not the foundation of the Word of God, but the foundation of her emotions. And she said, I got to have that. That's what will make me wise. That will fulfill the lust of my flesh. Paul, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, he looks at you and says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And he begins to list out for you and I the spiritual blessings, where Malachi 3 says, you wanted the blessings from me, you better prove me, do what I ask you to do, bring in the tithes and the offerings, do what the law says to do, and then I'll bless you. And you know what Paul says? Eh, that is not you. That is not another, that another Jesus, that another spirit, that another gospel is not you. You know who you are? You're this guy. So when you're doing things and you're living life and you're learning and you're growing and you're active, active in the work of the ministry here, you know what you're doing? It You're not doing it to gain something. You've already got it. But rather you're doing it to please him who chose you to be the soldier. That's where we were this morning in 2 Timothy 2. What have you gotten? Verse 4, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, what? I love it. Holy. First thing, first, well, first thing is he chose you. <laughs> he had a plan to do it. But then he says you're holy. Holy. Now, nobody ever says that you're holy. I got holy socks. <laughs> it's because I got a hole in them, <laughs> you know. Holy. That's a, another word for that is sanctified. Saint. You belong to Him. You're set apart now for Him and what He's doing. That's why you're without blame before Him in love. When you looked at, 
Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says, therefore, now, now therefore being justified, we have what? Peace with God. You stand in the throne room. You stand before God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit without blame now. Because whose righteousness do you have? You have Christ's righteousness. You have His co- You're co-equal with Him now. And when the Father looks at you and He says, you know what you are? You are holy. Woo-hoo. Oh, thank you, Jesus. No. You, hey, this is good stuff. Yeah. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of the children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. That predestinate us unto the adoption. You've got a destiny. You've got a job. You've got a standing now in the family. Not as a child and as a baby, but as an adult. You know what an adult does in the family? I got my three kids are now adults. I've graduated them to their adulthood. When we have conversations now, it isn't a dad telling them what to do. It's rather, hey, what do you think we should do? And I take in and I listen and then I make the decision and they live with it. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) But the thing is, is what are they though? They're adults, and as a dad, I've had to learn to talk to them as adults and rather than children. See, the father looks at you and says, you're an adult in the family. Grow up and act like one. Because all adults, some of you guys need to grow up. Some of you don't want to. I understand that. Next verse, to the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Whoa, look at that. You're accepted. The one thing every person in the world wants, acceptance. You've already got it in Him. You've already got So you're not trying to do something to get His acceptance, are you? You've already got it in who you are in Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. He, look, that, boy, these, we're not even doing them justice, and that's just because of time. You think about what's going on here. According to the riches of His grace, you are wealthy. You have forgiveness of sins. That means when you screw up, because you're going to screw up, that God doesn't reach down with the with the paddle of correction. Now he's gonna correct you. But how does he correct you? 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17. He uses the word of God. It's profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. Woo, you thought you, oh, good, I don't have to listen to that. No, you got it coming your way. But how's he going to do it? He does it with his word. What is Satan trying to do to you? Not be in his word. And by the way, not be in his word rightly divided. That's simple. See, what does he want? He wants you to be out there just claiming everything. And he says, no, you have have such wealth in Christ. Don't waste your time out there. Be in here. Verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in some wisdom and prudence. No, I messed that word up, didn't I? How much wisdom? How much prudence? All of it. That verse over in chapter 3 that he says that you may be able to comprehend. Wow. I had a guy tell me one time, Rick, you just can't know that stuff. I said, the verse says I can. Because it says I can comprehend it. It says he's given me all wisdom. and He has adequately equipped me to go and to live and to be who I am in Christ in my life and time and the, and, the, and the interactions that I have with other people. You know what I have to do? I got to believe it. I got to study it, get it together, but I got to believe it. 
First Thessalonians 2, verse 13, they hear the word of God, they got the word of God, it effectually worketh in you that believe. Next verse. I, by the way, verse 8, I got so many notes on it, I don't even know where to start. Wisdom. You know some things. You, you, begin to learn, you begin to learn to use what you know properly. That knowledge, you get in the information. Wisdom is using it properly. You understand that. You know? You can know how to... I, I can put an air conditioner on the roof. I can do it. But that don't mean it wise that I'm doing it. I can order the crane, direct it up there, so I need it right there. After that, it isn't smart for Rick to be in charge. <laughs> but when the guys who have not only the knowledge, but they have the wisdom are doing it, then everybody in the room's cold. See? Prudence. Prudence is to get the big picture, to look beyond, to look below the surface, to have the big picture in mind. Here's the wisdom. Here's how you use the knowledge. But have, have you ever been in a swimming pool with, with goggles on or a big mask and you kind of split it with the water and you see the clear and then you see that? You ever see that? Or If you didn't, you need to borrow some and go find a swimming pool, jump in and figure. Prudence is being able to look underneath the surface. Prudence is being able to, yeah, we, we know what's going on up here, but what's going on down here? Seeing it all. Then in verse 9, he says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together and one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, there's the body of Christ, there's you and I, and in the earth, there's the nation of Israel. So what do I have an understanding of here now? I understand verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. I have an inheritance and my inheritance is pertaining to the heavenly places out there, and not Israel, who's got the earth, but I've got the heaven. And you know what? There's the wisdom and prudence. I know where, so I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. I'm not a Malachi 3, I'm trying to get you to fill up the offering box back there. You need to, though, okay? Verse 13. By, oh, by the way, well, verse 13, whom ye also trusted. I skip verse 12, I'm sorry. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That's an interesting little verse stuck in there. Because you know what we understand? That whatever we do in word and deed, we do it all to the glory of God the Father. That's just a little reminder verse. What all this is for and for you to have glory and pomp and circumstance and the back patent. It's for him to have the glory and the honor in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance under the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Woo! Now we got the Holy Spirit involved. And what does he come along and do? He seals the deal, doesn't he? Have you ever shook hands with someone that they're going to do something and they don't do it? And all you've got is a handshake? Judge Judy says, shame, shame, shame. You've got to have it in writing. See, I know. No, the Holy Spirit, God the Father says, you know what I'm going to give you? I've given you all of this so far. Colossians 2 verse 10, it's talking about you being complete in Him. We'll talk about that next week. He comes along and says, you know what the Holy Spirit's going to do for you? He's going to tell you that seal is going to be an indication that I'm going to get the job done. That is how you know that what God said, I'm going to come and take you and dress the heavens with you, that he's going to do it. Because I gave you a member of the Godhead. Now, by the way, you have all three members of the Godhead in you. That's what chapter 4 is going to tell you. Okay, But the seal of the Spirit... A seal in Scripture, it indicates ownership. That's why Paul would say, what, know you not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. <laughs> Woo, boy, you get that down in your thinking. 
That'll change how you deal with your, your old vehicle. Seal in the Bible indicates a finished transaction. It implies security. Boy, isn't it, isn't it good to know that he's going to redeem that purchased possession under the praise of his glory? It implies identification. Revelation 7, the 144,000, they get a seal placed in them, don't they? The seal of the Lord. They're identified as the Lord's people, God's people. It implies secrecy too, by the way. You ever get a letter sealed so tight? I get, I get them every now and then and they tape it all shut. You're like, man, what is in it? <laughs> and it's like, don't open till your birthday. It's like, eh, that's tomorrow. I can't wait. I got to open it now, you know. No, it's, it's seal, it's secrecy. It also implies, in, in Scripture, it implies obligation and a duty to perform. It implies authority. The king would put the seal in the, in the, in the wax by the authority of the king. Here it is. It implies likeness, that signet ring. Boy, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, that is at the end of the list of all spiritual blessings. And it is no less important than the first one in the list. And you know what? You have it, and I have it. And when the Holy Spirit comes in, and when you come in, and you begin to understand your identity in Christ, and you begin to understand who you are in Christ. What begins to happen then is that simplicity that's in Christ comes in. Because you know what happens? We like to muddle the, muddy the waters. Come back over with Romans 11 and verse 6. A verse that we take out of context, but at the same time it says what we like to say, Second, or Romans 11, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. You know what we like to do? We like to meddle them up a little bit, muddy the water. And you know what the Holy Spirit says? I'm going to sit over here till you figure out what you're doing is pretty stupid. Now, he doesn't say it like that. Okay? He says, you go over there to that block wall and beat your head up against it and try to figure this all out. And when you get bloodied and tired, I'm sitting right here. You just come right back to me. And we'll come over here and do it God's way. According to the riches of his grace. You go on over there. You, you knock yourself silly. I'm waiting for you. Ephesians chapter number 4, we were just there, verse 23, says that we are to renew the spirit of our mind. The simplicity that is in Christ, folks, is just a simple way of saying how you're thinking about things. Yea, hath God said. Yeah, he did. You know what he said? He said, I've blessed you with all spiritual blessings. There is nothing, you are not any higher than I. And I am not any higher than you. The only reason why this is elevated is because we elevate the Word of God to be preached. That's the only reason why this sits up. You know what he says? He goes, I got a job for you to do, I got a vocation for you. I'm going to call you my ambassador. You're going to have the full authority of my government behind you. Now go, and let's get on with the work. And the moment that you make this about you, I'm just going to sit right over here and wait, wait, wait for you to get done. And then when you get done, we'll go back to work. And it's that simple. The simplicity that's in Christ. That's why Paul talks about every aspect of your life. 
husbands, wives, dads, parents, children, the job, retirement. You thought you guys, retired guys, were off the hook. No, he talks about you. And he says, you know, you got a job, and it starts. It's a simple thing. I'm trying to think of the verse, and it just slipped my mind. That he's able to do above everything that we think, ask or think, okay? You think you got something, I'm going to, he's like, I already done thought of that. That's a waste of time. Don't do that. We're going to go do this. Follow that? Now, how you get there is by renewing your mind. By renewing how you think about your identity in Christ. So when we talk about living as who you are in Christ, what we're talking about. Do you know how wonderful it is to know that you have your sins forgiven and you're not having to go do 1 John 1, 9 every time you make a mistake? That is tremendous. Or having to call Rick and confess them. Rick, you're going to get the Rick's voicemail is what you're going to get. But what, how, the, understand the liberty and the freedom in the simplicity. I went and took care of everything. All you have to do is believe me. Satan will come along and say what? Did God really say that? Because there's verses over here that says you've got to go do some things if you don't do those, then you're not really saved. you got to do those things to prove you are saved. you got to do those things to stay saved. you got to do those things to stay in the family. Of, and you know what happens? We go and do it because we take our eye off the ball, don't we? The simplicity that is in Christ. It's that simple, folks. If it was... and. and I'm looking at the time, don't worry. 1 Corinthians 1, I know. 1 Corinthians 1. These are, I don't know how to express it anymore or any other way. Look at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Well, look at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? How did he do that? By keeping it simple. What does the wisdom of the world want? They want it complex. They want to tell me what to do. Figure it out. They want the Big Bang Theory. They want this. They want that, 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 that. And the next thing you know, you're swimming around going, well, which way is even up? And you know what he says? By the preaching of the cross, we save them that believe. Verse 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Folks, you want to be where you belong, it's in the simplicity that's in Christ. Life gets complicated enough. <laughs> and it gets to be heavy and hard. But the simplicity is right there in Christ and who God has made you in Him. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the simplicity that we have in your Son. And Lord, I just pray that as we go through the week and as we think about things and we look into to life and we, we uh, observe the things of life, that we would just simply remember who we are in your Son. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory in that. In your name we pray. Amen.